The next presentation will be given by my dear friend, Loris Lopituso from Rome, Italy. I have got to know him in this process of guideline creation. He is a very nice guy, very competent guy. He fulfilled his task in small intestinal bacterial overgrowth to, a very, to an excellent degree. And he will inform us about the aspect of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, which patients and which tests. Loris, please go ahead. So good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure for me to um, describe what uh, um, our first UAG consensus uh, described regarding small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So let me thank, first of all, the organizer for inviting me uh, to this talk. I'm greatly honored to be here with you today. In the next few minutes, uh, we will uh, uh, face what is the definition of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, and then also define which are the patients that should be tested for SIBO, which is the ideal test to be used which is the ideal dose to be used in this test. And then, of course, we will see how the, the results of the hydrogen breath test should be interpreted for SIBO. I have to say that uh, um, it has been really difficult to um, share um, an, um, an ideal um, statement and recommendation in this field. This is uh, because of uh, the number of the studies that is uh, very low and the number of patients also in, uh, included in these studies is uh, really small with uh, um, a very heterogeneous uh, methodology used. So the results coming from these studies uh, in these years have been uh, controversial and also conflicting. But at the end, we, were, we have been able to uh, have a common and a great uh, consensus on the on on the all the statements and the recommendation that we will see together in the next minutes. Let's jump immediately to the definition of the small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Um, the first statement of our consensus says that the small intestinal bacterial overgrowth is the abnormal presence of a, uh, an excessive number of bacteria in the small intestine. How this uh, can happen? Um, this is due mainly because of uh, um, the most important control mechanism fall down. Let's think to the um, IgA secretion, let's think to the peristaltic activity or to the action of the saliva. Um, when all these mechanisms that are making uh, uh, together and uh, allowing a good homeostasis of the intestinal barrier uh, disappear, well, there are the ideal conditions for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. At the same time, there are some specific conditions that can predispose to SIBO, and we will see which are these conditions because these are really important to define the ideal patients that can uh, benefit from this test. Um, historically, SIBO was defined as the microbiological presence of at least 100,000 colonic forming unit per ml, ml of colonic bacteria in a jejunal aspirate. However, this kind of test is really invasive and also this test is subject to a high rate of false positive. In this field, the qualitative microbiological composition is also really important. And we will see how also the presence of methane production bacteria can influence the result of, of this test. The definition, uh, a correct definition of SIBO is also uh, uh, really crucial because then the use of antibiotics can improve the symptoms, but if we do not identify the underlying condition sustaining SIBO, then the problem can recur. So the next statement of our consensus says that SIBO may be more likely to be clinical relevant if the bacteria in the small bowel are anaerobes. Which is the clinical portrait, the clinical presentation of SIBO? 
Um, this is, again, is uh, uh, crucial to know because uh, this can help in defining the ideal patients that can undergo uh, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth testing. Um, SIBO is characterized by a wide spectrum of clinical manifestations ranging from unspecific functional abdominal symptoms such as bloating, abdominal discomfort, flatulence, to a less fre frequent clinical presentation uh, with severe malabsorption and nutrient deficiency uh, with diarrhea, anemia, vitamins uh, uh, deficiency and iron deficiency, steatorrhea, um, up to weight loss. Uh, as I was saying before, there are multiple independent risk factors that uh, are uh, important to know because they can define the, the patient that can be more susceptible to, uh, the, um, to the appearance of SIBO. And these are non-anatomical abnormalities, such as the presence of small bowel diverticula, or post-surgical structural changes, for example, ileocecal valve resection, medications that can slow gut motility, let's think to narcotics or to anti-diarrhea, hypo or acloridria that can be due to surgery or to autoimmune gastritis, or for example, to the use of PPIs. And then again, small bowel dysmotility, um, that can be found in specific diseases such as IBS or hepatic encephalopathy, gastroparesis, obesity, um, inflammatory bowel diseases, chronic pancreatitis. These are all conditions that can cause small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And so the definition of this kind of patients is uh, really helpful in defining and um, having this, the other statement of our consensus that uh, state that SIBO is characterized by a wide clinical spectrum ranging from mild and unspecific intestinal symptoms to a severe malabsorption symptoms. And uh, so the evaluation of SIBO can be considered in the presence of these symptoms and in presence of sign of malabsorption. Uh, of course, this has to be done in the absence of another diagnosis on endoscopy or imaging, especially if there are underlying conditions, and we have seen which are these underlying conditions, which can increase the risk of SIBO. So we should have a moderate to high pretest probability. This, the presence of a moderate to high pretest probability will allow to have a good test with a reduced number of false positive patients. Again, which test should be used for SIBO? Uh, as I was saying in the introduction of this presentation, um, there are controversial results in this field. And so the recommendation 3.4 that came up from our consensus states that until a true gold standard is established, hydrogen breath testing can be used for the diagnostic evaluation of SIBO. And uh, technically, a standard 15 minute sample rate is recommended in clinical studies with a duration of the test of 120 minutes. Uh, coming, following up with this uh, uh, consensus, uh, we uh, recommended that for the assessment of SIBO uh, by hydrogen breath testing, glucose or lactulose can be used. Um, again, here there are um, a lot of controversial and conflicting results, but we have been able with a great consensus, as uh, you can see, 82% of agree with only 5% of disagreement for this recommendation we came up with a, um, a strong recommendation. And again, a strong statement, statement 3.9, saying that uh, hydrogen breath testing with lactulose or glucose may result in false positive, positive diagnosis of SIBO caused by rapid transit time with an early colonic fermentation of the substrate. Um, to avoid this risk, um, we can pair this test with uh, an orocecal transit time evaluation, such as with scintigraphy. And we will see in the next minutes how this is important. 
However, in the absence of a concomitant scintigraphy to assess small bowel transit time, glucose should be preferred in non-surgical patients because the false positive rate for the detection of SIBO is lower with glucose than with lactulose. And this again came up with an 83% of agreement. Coming to the back to the, uh, to the methodolog methodological aspects of this test, the standard dose for glucose should be around 50 grams diluted in 200 milliliter of water. Um, um, in children, the dosage should be around two grams per kilos uh, for a maximum of 50 grams diluted in 200 to 250 milliliter of water. For lactulose, the dose should be around between 10 and 20 grams diluted in 250 ml of water. The same doses should be used in children, uh, but with a, a reduced volume of water between 100 to 200 milliliter. How the result should be interpreted? This is, again, is uh, the hot topic uh, uh, for these guidelines. And uh, um, studying the, um, all the reports available in the literature, the controversial results do not allow to have a unique definition in this field. But we know, and, and, and this knowledge is coming from our clinical experience, uh, coming from many years of clinical experience in this field, we know that uh, um, glucose usually results in a single peak, uh, early peak of H2 excretion. And the most used cutoff is uh, between 10 and 12 ppm. For lactulose, typically, you know that we have two, peak, two distinct uh, hydrogen peaks, where the first one is uh, due to the intestinal, small intestinal microflora activity while the second one, the second late peak, is indicating the colonic bacterial metabolism. As you may imagine, the key limitation of this test is the high variability of the oral cycle transit time, both in health and in disease, resulting in a high rate of false positive diagnosis. That's why the identification of the ideal patient and the um, identification of a moderate to high um, pretest probability can allow to reduce the number of false positive patients. If a concomitant uh, scintigraphy is not available, then we have two options the interpretation of the results considering the pretest probability of SIBO or serial test with the hydrogen breath test being followed by a transit test with scintigraphy. However, this is not an ideal situation since uh, the, the uh, horocycle transit time can change day by day, uh, even in normal patients. The last point is the me measurement of the methane production that can improve the test performance. There are patients that have an uh, great and uh, um, enormous increase of uh, methane production. And these usually are patients with uh, an increase in, ab in uh, abdominal discomfort, in abdominal flatulence. And most of the time, the production, methane production, uh, the levels of methane production is connected with the constipation and with the severity of constipation. So in conclusion, the statements regarding the interpretation of the hydrogen breath test for SIBO says that the diagnostic criteria for the diagnosis of SIBO using breath test have not been confirmed and uniformly accepted. However, the clinical rest relevance of a positive results needs to be considered in the light of the pretest probability of SIBO in the individual patient. The use of hydrogen breath testing for SIBO is non-invasive, is safe, is inexpensive, and this is a very positive point to use this test for SIBO together with all the elements that we have, been, uh, we have seen uh, so far. However, the interpretation of results is limited by important confounding factor, 
in particular the variability of OCTT. So the risk of false positive or false negative breath test for SIBO can be reduced by combining the breath test with an independent measurement of orocecal transit time, such as scintigraphy. And with this, I would like to thank you again for the attention.